that I have a very strange accent when I speak English, but it's not my native language. I'm German and I live in the Netherlands for more half my life, so you either have a Dutch or a German accent, or maybe, maybe both. So let's try and figure out what it is. Uh, as uh, Afi said, I'm an OWASP for a very, very long time already. And who is in the information security? Are there any developers? That's really good. Who is in the security uh, work for more than two years? More than five years? More than seven years? Do you ever get frustrated? That was my problem. I get an annual security frustration. And uh, actually, when I did the OWASP EU 2015, I told my wife, you know what? I do this conference, then I'm done. I'm done with security. We buy a camping place, no security anymore, open Wi Fi. Screw it. I'm done every year. My wife looked at me and said, Yeah. And she was right. I still live with OWASP when I'm still in security. And I try to make it a better world. It's all the frustrations I get annually. But I think that's a part of the work, most likely. So you wonder maybe about the cryptic title, Hippos. Uh, this all started when I had frustrations. You know, the, the security companies in the world, they always say the fear, uncertainty, and disorder, the FUD. And I promised my wife to take a vacation. I'm not really good at taking vacations. Because it cannot go away, you know, else everything will collapse. If I take vacation, there will be disorder, uncertainty, everything will be breaking down. And she convinced me to take a motor ride up to the North Cup. Two weeks on a motorbike, no internet. It was really great. And I came back, and you know what? The world was still turning. Nothing really, really bad happened. Yes, there was fraud, there was some hacks. But it was not that bad. The world kept turning, I still could do online banking, I still could go to my work, I still had electricity. So, hey guys, what do we worry about? That was the first thing. So I was relaxed, for two weeks, no incidents, no anxious calls. I got back and I looked around and I said, what do we do right and what do we do wrong as a security community? And this talk is about how to engage, how to think. It's more the human factor than the technical factor. You know, four years ago, five years ago, there was a lot of talks about thinking out of the box. Was it here as well in Israel? Out of the box thinking. Guess what? You cannot think out of the box. The box is what you are. The box is your history, your experiences, things you learned, you read, you encountered. That is your box. So yes, you can widen your box, you can enlarge your box by looking over the borders to other uh, areas. You can invite in the box of your project team by having people from different aspects, different age, different genders in your project team. But your box will be your box. And your thing is to widen the box and sometimes peek out of the box and let's see what other boxes are out there. I'm really happy to see so many females. In Western Europe, we have a problem. We have, we have a conference of 500 people and we have four females. We are really excited. Wow! That's really stupid. Because being a female, you have different expectations. And there's something I always use to tease. There wasn't uh, actually uh, research, but they did. They asked lots of questions to people. Like, what is two times two? And what they saw is for males, in general, a smaller part of the brain worked. But the bigger part, uh, females, a bigger part of the brain, more brain activity was there. Even there was a logical question. And the wrong male answer would be, yes, you see, logical work is more tiring for females. But the other side is, they have a wider scope. They look at different problems. We as males will focus, hey, problem, solve. And they have other things to look at, things we would miss out and forget. So one thing is to enlarge your box, have different age, different genders, and also look what others do. And then in 2012, I had uh, watched a tech talk from Ernesto Ciroli, and it's about his work, as, uh, his time as aid worker. And I thought it's actually the, quite the same problems he's addressing as we have. Because we, the security people, we want to help, isn't it? We want to make the world better. We want to help develop a wide secure code. 
And he is telling about his time in the 70s when he was a young aid worker from Italy going to Africa because the Africans were starving. Apparently, Italians are good in growing vegetables, so they might better go there and tell them how to grow vegetables. And they go there, and there's a river that's annually flooding the banks, so there's very fertile grounds, and they're growing zucchinis and tomatoes. And in his very funny way, he says, in Italy, tomatoes like did. There, Amer tomatoes were like that. They were really excited, a good harvest, and then guess what? The hippos came and ate all. All the money, all the time, all the work was wasted. They said, the hippos, where do the hippos come from? They said, from the river. That is why we don't grow vegetables here, because the hippos will eat all. And that's how we address problems. We hear a problem with our box, our point of view, we go there, hey, solve the problem, I know the solution. We jump in, we don't ask, we don't understand the context. We have to answer because we are a very smart security guy, aren't we? We are super smart, we can break stuff. But did we understand the context? Did we really help them? And then as Siroli at least says, at least he fed the hippos. One thing good, other people waste money, time and effort not improving anything. At least the hippos had a good time. So I want to take the analogy for hippos, for efforts, be it technology, be it time, be it money, we can waste with not helping. That's very easy in security to waste money and time and not really helping. And the problem is, if you waste all the time money, the worst thing is, if you don't understand the context of those you want to help, it's not only a waste of time and money, it's only very counterproductive and people will not talk to you anymore. So not only time and money is worth spent, uh, lost, also future work will be also lost, will not improve. So there are some security myths. And we as a security com community, we are actually the cause of that evil. Because in the past, what did we do? We tell people security is mean business, isn't it? Security is the most important thing in our life. We do security, so security over everything. Highest priorities for project manager, business, everybody is security, isn't it? Guess what? Other people have other priorities. It's not all about security. Security is expensive. If you want to have good security, you have to spend a lot of money because all the tools are costing a lot of money. All the external consultants cost a lot of money. Security is expensive. If you want the security right, you have to spend money. And the last not least, security is complex. Not everybody can do security. You need a very high intellectual security consultant for a lot of money to do security right. So guess what? Who is actually managing software projects? It's a software project manager. What are the two major concerns of, an over, uh, of a project manager? Staying in time and in budget. So the two things he does not want is complexity, that costs time, and he doesn't want something that's expensive, that's because it's budget. So we actually have are very good in targeting on those two things they don't want. By this fall, they say, hey, security, oh, expensive, complex, get out. Hey, we lost. It's a really big problem. So, addressing this, how should it be done? And I really, really uh, advise you to see the talk from Esther Siloli, and you will see the similarities. First of all, security guys. Don't be the mean security guy. It does not help. I have the fortunate or unfortunate of being not the smallest, six foot four. I have a beard because I don't like to shave. I get more friendly face apparently. Now I get gray, so my, over my years I get a friendlier face. I have long hair, so people are like, ooh, it's really pity. You have to welcome other people with open arms and friendliness and kindness. 
It's the same when you take a bus in the morning, you get in, you don't look at the bus driver. You think next time you're late in the bus stop, you run, he will stop for you? Why should he? You never looked at him, you never wished a good morning. It's very small things and accepting people. Looking over the board, be polite, see others, recognize them. So don't be mean, be happy, be friendly. Security has been known as the ministry of no. And guess what? Saying no every time, nobody will ask you in the future. Don't upset people. I don't see a phrase how easy that is. I see so many times a security report. Who does security testing? Who delivers a nice security report? PDF, listing all the issues, smacking developers. You stupid developers, that's what you did wrong. Ha! And guess what? The developers don't like them. Because I get a report for all the issues, there's nothing how to fix them. And it's a PDF report, it's worthless, because it does not live in my context. And they say, hey, I broke the application. How do you like me? Not. My first code review was back when, then, when I was a mechanic. And there was a uh, PLC program for robotics in the checks molding industry. And sometimes it happened that a robotic arm got scratched between the molds of the machines. And I did my first code review not knowing what code review is. I just had a course of PLC programming. I printed out a lot of diagram. It was a very complex program with a lot of robots and uh, arms moving. Guess what? I could find a problem. And I was very happy. I found a problem. I went on, next morning, I went up to the developer and said, I found it. You have a bug. Was he happy? Of course not. Because me, the grease monkey, the guy from the workflow, I touched his code, I tell him he did it wrong. I did not understand back then, I would never be able to write the same program because he was experienced. They had so much considerations, time, uh, things moving, not hitting each other, supply chain on everything. But I had only one focus, it's finding that one bug. It's the same for the security people. How many of the security people have development background? That's really, really good. I see in the Netherlands, more and more security people have no development background. And the development background, I don't mean, yes, on a university I did code, I had a coding class. That is not development. That's hobby. Development is being in an enterprise project team with project managers, with the time pressure, with all the considerations, and then security. Then you understand the context of the world for the developers, how to help, how to address them. And don't hide. I talked to a company, uh, a customer, and I talked and uh, the talk with the CISO. And he said, oh, okay, we have to improve security firm and lifestyle because, hey, there's another compliance we have to approve to. Who do you want to talk to? I said, okay, I need developers, I need the functional testers. Functional testers, we forget about the resource of functional testers for security. They really can help. But, hey, they're non-technical. Who they can help us? But they can. I think the project managers, the stakeholders, and the guy was like, oh, side, you want to talk to all of them? I said, what do you think? We cannot do security by ourselves. You have to go out there, be visible, having an open door. And for the pen testers, a lot of pen tests being done externally, or when it's internal, then you are in your own room. So come in with your sunglasses, your hoodie. All the security people have hoodies, I don't know why. They're useful, I get them for free. So we all go in there, we don't talk to developers, we sit in our box, we do our security magic, and out comes a report. When you are there anyway, start to do the security testing with the developers. Don't hide. Be out there, be visible for developers, so they can contact you. Meet them. Meet others, understand them. That's so important. How many of you have security people have developers friends. And you talk about them, with, about development? It's less. Because when we talk to them about security, they say, ah, oh, security. Yes, it's the compliance check, the report we get, PDF. When we talk to them about development, that's the one thing that catches developers, because it's their blood, tears, and sweat. 
That's what they keep awake of. So call to them and pay attention. Listen to their problems. And you actually can help them. When you go there and not like being the bully on the school plane and kick them, but be the child doctor who looks at their child, their software, their code, when they are appreciated, they will, the software is their passion. We can help them to improve what they're building eight plus hours a day. Then you help them to improve their child, and then you are friends. Why don't you smack them in the face and say, oh, you look at your child. Three arms, one leg, ha ha. But when I kick this one leg, it falls over. Ha, <laughs> it's on the floor. Does not work. So pay attention, listen, understand their context. We have all the security tools, all the nice security tools. I want to, don't want to blame the defenders because they're really good. We need them tools. But we have to integrate them in their context and in their world. I've been a developer and I really miss the floating sensation when you're developing. You are in your code. It's a situation I cannot uh, describe. Time, space are gone and you're hacking away. One time I stopped because my wife, my girlfriend back then called me, he's like, hey, you know the guests are at home. <laughs> Come back to this world. Guests? What guests? It's your birthday. It's like, Today? I'm coding. And this sensation is so great. But now what you do, it's like, hey, developer, do your great job, be floating. And by the way, every hour check the security report or the security dashboard for this tool, for another tool, and you have to correlate and then think in your code how to solve it will not work. So we have to deliver the security issues in their context, in their environment, on a way they can understand. When I look in the ASVS, who knows the OWASP ASVS? It's the Application Security Verification Standard. It's a really, really good list of security measures. But actually, when you look at them from a developer point of view, almost none address developers. But we say, hey, that's a really good tool for developers. Developers, who uh, is responsible for the decision of a two-factor authentication? Nobody. It's not the developer's decision. It's the business, it's the risk decision, and the developer has to implement it. So go to the, go to the developer, it's like, two-factor authentication. Yeah. Yes, but then what? How to do it? That's how we should address it. We can address them on the right way if we understand the context, the technology. Again, who is doing secure code reviewing? And of those, how many people have development background? Because that's what you need. You cannot review code if you don't know the technology. Because you cannot sit down with the developers and talk about their code if you can't read the code and can't write yourself because there's stuff you cannot imagine. So talk to them on the same eye level. You can be the crowbar to help them to improve the code. I had a customer where the developer said, I looked at the code, there's so many uh, development depths. It was really dramatic. And I said, guys, what are you doing? Have you never heard about refactoring, clean code, stuff like that? And they're like, yes, we know. But the business does not give us money and time to clean up the code. They said, what? And the business says, we want new functionality. We don't pay for refactoring. It's like telling somebody who paints your house, yes, I want new paint, but I don't pay for scrubbing off the old paint. Don't expect them to call it to stick for years. But that happens. In the Netherlands, you are a new junior developer for maybe six months. I don't know how it's here. How long are you a junior developer? Three years. That's really, really good. I wasn't agreeing. It's the same what they said. But the Netherlands is half a year. When we got my previous company, we got developers from the high school, from the university. First thing we did, took them internally and really taught them about development because in the university, they're leaking behind. They do the best, but they fail. But three years is really good because they have a really good base, but the Netherlands is a half year. Then you're medial. So how long do you stay medial developer? Another three years? So at least you have six years experience when you become a Senior developer. Now imagine when you are a project manager and the average age in the Netherlands are 35, 40, 45. The average developer is between 25 and 30. So only for maturity level, when they talk about what has to be done, there is this human 
difference as 25, 27 year old to talk up to somebody who's almost 40. So it's not equal. It's really, really weird. And then you are a senior developer. You have six years, seven years experience, eight years experience. And then what is the next step in your career? Management, yes. So we have somebody who's really, really good and trained experience in development. What do we do? We take him away from what he's good in and we put him in a position he can't. Because he's a developer. And if a good developer, they're not really good in talking to people. We make him a manager. What could possibly go wrong? So be supportive. Developers care about their code, and you can help them to improve the quality of the code. I had many times, when I, every time I do a security check or a pen test or a code review, I always talk to the team. When you have a good team, they already know what's wrong with their code. They know what's wrong with the application, but they just have not the time. They don't get the time to fix it. And you are the external crowbar that can help them to improve the code quality. That's why I t stopped talking to them about security. Dennis Cruz many years had uh, uh, said, makes security invisible for developers. And I didn't back then believe that, but now I'm all on wiser and have to say, yes, Dennis, you were right. Security people do not care about security because we bash them for many years. But talk about them by the quality. Help them with open source tools, coding uh, quality tools, coding standard tools, then you increase security by maturity of coding. And you are the crowbar to give them time and money to improve their code and security. You are the ones they want to talk to if you help them. Don't make them teach weird tricks. It's something every time I, I talk to the security people, how they set up a security development life cycle, I like, we are in a technology loving time. So business believes, if I have a tool, it will solve my problems. If I have a fancy new secure coach uh, analysis tool, it will all be magically safe code. And then I have to overstop stop 10 security check, isn't it? I have a green bar, so a green bar means I'm secure. Before you start implementing whatever tool of process, the most important thing is acceptance. So security people, we have false positives, false negatives. False positive is you're looking for a security issues. So a false positive is the tool says this is an issue, but it's not. The false negative is like this code is good, but it's not good. What do you think? What is more dangerous, false positive or not false negatives? Who thinks false positives are more dangerous? Who thinks false negatives are more dangerous? It's depending who looks at the code. False negative for security people, it's really weird because we have no idea. There is some bug or flaw and we don't know. But when you talk to developers, false positives cost them time and money, but they're not paid to review your outcome of your tool. So again, address the findings and fill the findings depending on who is reviewing them. When you're a developer and you're paid for developing, and then you have a list of hundreds of findings where 30% are un untrue, acceptance of the tool will be really, really low because it's not helping them. Then secure, um, sorry, agile development, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. You know that here? Developers, agile, secure, DevOps. So we have this continuous development train. Isn't it cool? We build code, we hit the button, it compiles, it does tests, it packages, it deploys to test. And then comes the first code, uh, the security toll gate, secure code review. So they, uh, oh, stop. And then uh, three weeks later, they get their findings. They're already two release further, but no, hey, we found an issue. No, it's toll gate. It is too late. And the next thing is then another button, another compile, build everything, and deploy it to acceptance. Now we do a penetration test. What is the time you can start with a secure code analysis? The moment you set up your build tools. Because you don't need a line of code to integrate it. You can already, in your build process, can find the small bugs, the low-hanging fruit, with your code quality tools, PMT, checks out the find bugs, your secure code analyzing tool from whatever vendor. 
Very, very in the beginning. I'm not waiting for tests. When you develop it, every morning having results. When the developer best is integrated in their IDE, so when they're writing code, they get already the feedback what you should do. And you need acceptance because when the acceptance is not done, they will write code that is not detected by a tool and not being by default better. And you can write uh, and use the integration, the dynamic code review tool already, the moment you set up your server. The moment I have a target system, I can start penetration of scan this. Don't wait for acceptance. That's months behind development time, months too late. So very early, the moment you set it up, the target, you set up the validation and the scanning. And start appreciating. Whatever job you have, whatever work you do, if you won't be appreciated in what you're doing, you won't do your best. When you come to customer, instead of being accepted and welcomed, and you will put in a small room with a broken chair, and I had that one time, there's a sign. They don't want to have you there. The same is when you are going to a public restroom. And the woman is appreciated by the work done, she will keep it clean. Make the work their concern. When you go to a restaurant or your office canteen and the cook or whoever waits you, you address them, they will be happy and they look at you. Guess what? The same for developers. When you appreciate them, when you encourage them to improve their code, when you encourage them to learn and strive for better code quality, they will do better jobs. In the Netherlands, as a developer, you have always the same pains. Business is always you are too expensive. It takes too much time. And there's always the threat of being outsourced. Joe, you're a young developer, your career is developing, you really like the code, and they say, yes, but might outsource your uh, department in two years. That really encourages you to do work, isn't it? So encourage and appreciation. Help them to build secure code. Don't be in the ministry of no. It's very important. You are there to help them. Ministry of no, when you always say no, you want to get help. So be open-minded and listen to them. Security is not about saying no. Security is about making functionality possible on a responsible way. Data will be exchanged. Transaction will be executed. And you are the guys the developer can help, can help developers to make on a responsible way and not on Wild West. When you go to them, when you talk to them, that's how I want to conclude this. Take the advice from Mr. Strioli, sit down with them. The most important thing, don't start about your mind. First, start with shut up and listen. Thank you. Any questions? I'm above 40, so you have to speak up. Yes. Did, yeah. So the question is, uh, asked about, it's all about interact, interaction with the development team. So if there will be in the future more part-time security specialists than full-time. We do need security specialists. Security is not easy, definitely when it comes to subjects. But we make have to make them security aware by coding. So yes, there will be more interactions, more open door, but more understanding on both sides. I see more security people in the past that came from either functional testing or they come from uh, compliance. And now we need more people with technical background to understand that. So from the development team, they might change on the, like a proxy interaction. Yeah. More questions? Maybe later on, but uh, coffee. Thank you. Shut up and listen. My wife is.